Well, good day, America. I'm Richard Flingy here at EVTV with my compadre, Danu De Silva, lead technician at the uh, EVTV team. And we're here for our regular Friday show. And we have a lot of uh, good things coming up. We're going to talk a little bit about Tesla stock, uh, the, the uh, big news, the quantum scape. Quantum scape. Uh, and we're going to have uh, 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 one of Jack's retro videos uh, giving one of his battery dissection. So it's certainly a show you want to stay tuned to. So anyhow, we're in our proper uh, sanitary mode uh, <laughs> with our divider in between. Danu is uh, wearing his uh, mask. We're going to measure it. And if you yeah, notice, yeah, this good. magically goes through the <laughs> device. We're at six I feet. Think, yeah, we're good enough. And uh, here we go. Okay. I guess and I now can we're going to go to regular protocol. We actually... Whoops, couldn't yeah, afford good. plexiglass. So we used cardboard, and it was actually quite effective. And I it looks. Uh, do always tell you it is a serious disease, and we ask that you don't take it too trivially and, and certainly be careful and protect yourself. Yes. Well, Danu, the RV is left. Oh, boy. And that, that, was... that was a lot of work <laughs> is actually what it ended up being. Uh, uh, and I suggest that if you do that you have a few friends over and yep. uh, you plan on spending a lot of time oh yeah it was uh, up and down a lot and uh, we finally the guy moved in we gave him free lot rent for the first five days but we did charge him for the last two so we did get a little bit of money out of it and uh, we're glad he's on his way but we always encourage you uh, if you're doing a DIY project that's a good one to do, but I plan on a little bit of work. Well, in today's show, we're going to talk a little bit about Tesla, QuantumScape, and uh, I did yeah. pull an article about Tesla. Uh, it's end of the year. Stocks get a little up and down. People got to sell them. They have tax positions, uh, so they have a little bit different factoring uh, that all has to occur by December 31st. Yeah. So you start seeing... You know, a little stock volatility and some things go on. Right. And it's just a natural s event in uh, the stock business. Now, So Richard uh, has good business uh, background, good business history, so he can give us uh, some good advice and his opinion about the perfect. business aspect about this whole thing. And with my technical experience, I think I can give you guys a good understanding of my understanding of uh, what QuantumScape will be doing to Tesla. And other manufacturers in the field. So Richard, what no. do you have to Well, the thing think? that happened with Tesla, and the article I picked up was this J.P. Morgan statement that they felt the stock shares were going to fall to $90 a share. Wow. That's a big drop, and that is probably some wishful thinking. And uh, again, having experience in markets and being around for my 57 years here on planet Earth. <laughs> I happen to have a longtime personal friend that's a stockbroker that actually does uh, get out on a New York Stock Exchange at time. He's not there all the time. He mainly buys stocks and sells stocks for mutual funds. And one thing I will tell you is that these companies make money when the stock goes up and when the stock goes down. And they are certainly uh, trying to speak something into existence and they probably have a lot of forces behind them because those guys make money making it go back down so uh, you need to always keep that in the back of your hand I still will tell you my personal opinion of Tesla it's IBM in the 50s it's General Motors uh, Apple Amazon in the 90s yeah. it's just gonna be one of those stocks you want to buy, put the paperwork in a drawer, and slide it shut. You're gonna, people are just gonna want to own it. So uh, it's not, uh, there are certainly some greedy people and profit takers, but it's that stock. It's just gonna be a rock. Jack, Jack called it at $1,500. Um, he said in what five years or yep. two years and, and he, now it's six hundred dollars last week with the five to one split. calculated for the split that's so about up. three thousand yeah. uh, over three thousand right. so that's two times what jack was expecting and he so. uh, uh 
Well, certainly like this day, but it's, uh, uh, it's been a ride for a lot of people and investors and the short sellers want to make money going the other way too. Okay. And it's really uh, the, the little things that jiggle around on those kind of plays is going to be um, really just based on greed. Stock's going to be here. Put it in your drawer and uh, let it go. Anyhow, uh, on to Quantum's Gate. Yes. Which had a public announcement and uh, showed up with a stock about 48. They've been pumping it a little bit. Yep. They had uh, uh, some videos out this week. I suggest you check them out. Uh, they explain their technology. Stock lingered 48, 70. I mean, it didn't go from the initial uh stock offering to three or four times its earning. I think they kind of expected that. Uh, I, most likely people looked at it a little, little bit uh, realistic. Uh, the one um, point that I made, and then I'm going to let you get into some of these potentials and the things going on with the battery, but I had mentioned it in one of the prior videos about Medtronics. Medtronics is really a company that's kind of mastered a very small solid state battery, put it in pacemakers and defibrillators. Mm -hmm. But the deal is, it's a little bit of battery and it's a $36,000 device. So uh, the cost of the battery doesn't really matter because it makes your heart work. Uh, so with solid states, there are some out there and there is some application to them, but the ratio of the cost of the battery to the cost of the device is quite a bit different than what it would be in an automobile. Anyhow, the theoretical potential of a solid state battery, Daniel, mm -hmm. you know, I heard, and I heard this on a YouTube <laughs> video, making it true that it had 10 times the energy density of the lithium ion cylinder. And you heard what? I heard about twice as much. I mean, not ten, not ten times, two times as much. Um, okay. And this was on that presentation actually um, from QuantumScape in their um, most recent. Uh, okay, so you heard two and I heard ten, <laughs> so we're going to settle on fourteen. How does that sound? That sounds okay. <laughs> it's got to be something out there, folks. Yeah, I mean, they're talking about pretty good, uh, pretty big leap. I mean, we've been making progress over time and it's kind of slowed down over the past couple of years but this uh, going from uh, I mean small increments of uh, upgrades to a uh, 50% out I think it was uh, I think they said 50% so but twice as much it's it's a big it's a big deal so and um, this also opens up the market for so many other companies to kind of look into this technology mm -hmm. and come up with their own kind of solid state battery so Mm -hmm. and more co companies are going to be interested in this, so I think this is going to be a big game changer. You believe it has a, a market application that's going to find this place. Oh, yeah. I will agree with that statement, uh, and I'm from the Missouri, so <laughs> we shall see, and they can show me. Uh, the other thing that was interesting that was noted was this Toyota, very big company, and they sell a million cars or whatever a year, mm -hmm. and they have announced a solid state battery, and they're going to show it at the Olympics. Wow. So uh, that is coming up. We'll see what Toyota's got. See if we can uh, look under the hood. I uh, <laughs> am very curious to see how, how much uh, they actually do reveal. Uh, another thing we've got to mention, J.B. Straubel, a friend of us oh, yeah. here at EVTV. <laughs> It just so happens he's been a customer in the past. So uh, when the quantum skate, I, as a good journalist, emailed JB and said, hey, JB, you know, can you give us a little bone over here, toss us something to say on the show? I didn't get a response back, you know. <laughs> but I'll take that as a no. <laughs> but if he could, I bet he would. He's always been really pretty nice to us here. So when you got bigger fish to fry, I guess you keep frying them. Uh, the one thing I did want to mention that sort of rounds all this discussion out, which is something that uh, I, I do have expertise in, I have been in manufacturing for quite a few years, and that is that with the cylinder design, they've actually been making cylinder batteries for decades. Oh, yes. So the machine that builds the machine 
is well oiled. They have handling devices, they have grippers, they have manufacturing that is in second and third and fourth generation of fine tuning. And I know everybody thinks Tesla invented that whole big factory, but actually they were able to leverage off of some very keen manufacturing that was already in place. And when you go to this square design and all of the ins and outs that go along with manufacturing something, they may even get the battery to work, okay? But they still gotta figure out how to make it, yep. how to stack it, how to assemble it. They have to figure out how to handle it, how to test it, <laughs> which I think is a big part. They have to cycle these batteries before they verify them as new. So I believe that um, at some point the battery will come together and at some point the technology to build the battery will come together, but it may be a decade, you know, so yeah. it's going to be a while. And by that time, you know what will happen? <laughs> Tesla battery ba makers will be all wore out. They have to have new ones <laughs> anyhow. So anyhow, yeah. that is uh, what we're going to talk about. We're going to have Danny with some little battery tech talk. Yeah. And I'm really interested about, um, well, talk about the advantage of the solid state. Yeah, so I mean, one thing I want to piggyback off what you were saying, the cylinder manufacturing, it's um, the stuff that Tesla has in their cells, they're not designed to be expanding, but if it were to, since it's in a cylindrical shape, it won't affect the battery too much. Whereas in the, the quantum scape um, design, what they're planning is it's going to be doing a unidirectional expansion. So the, the lithium, that deposits on the anode is only going in one direction. But even if you wrap it in a coil, that still it can cause that expansion. Um, and I think it could, they would need to design some way of padding it so that it doesn't expand over too, I mean, too big and then potentially damage the packaging. Mm -hmm. So they at least have, I would say two, like you said, a decade, even two years, decade, somewhere in between uh, to go. And with Tesla, since they just came out with the 4680 cell, and they, they've already put so much investment into it, I think it's going to be a long time before Tesla looks into a, a solid-state battery. Uh, yeah. And um, I think it's going to be pretty cool because Tesla has their own design, and then now with QuantumScape coming up with the new design, it, it just makes it more, uh, more opportunities for newer battery technologies. So... Uh, and, and, you know... Uh, they may hit an asymmetrical uh, market. You know, it may end up in a home or a, a small power unit. Yeah. You know, automobiles, yeah, is the big the big dog on the on the lot. But uh, something good may turn out for them. And I and I feel that way about any battery, lithium ion battery manufacturer at this point. There are so many potential applications for this technology. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't just put out my money in, in cars. <laughs> Although one thing I do want to think, talk about is, remember um, Jack would always say um, with Volkswagen, their press releases, they yeah. would love to do express releases. And one thing you want to notice is QuantumScape has quite a few uh, Volkswagen employees or they past do. employees and yeah. uh, funding. Yeah. So, yep. And you know, Volkswagen my... is everywhere. So, <laughs> so they, they may be looking for the uh, magic bullet, but... You know, there's four-cylinder cars, there's eight-cylinder cars, there's six inline cylinder cars, there's diesel. <laughs> you know, they're all internal combustion engines, but there are different configurations. Yep. This battery may be kind of falling into one of those categories. But, yeah. it, may, it may be tractor trailers, who, or <laughs> bulldozers, who knows. Definitely Anyhow, need to take it with a grain of salt, yeah, so yeah. we'll see. But it's definitely good upgrades that we are seeing and that i want to transition into the the dendrite problem mm -hmm. that they've overcome um so with the chemistry that tesla uses that's one of the reasons they can't supercharge um faster than that they're doing already and they need to do cooling and heating when it's cold that dendrite formation i would use like a cheesecloth as mm -hmm. an analogy mm -hmm. so if you when you squeeze the cheese um the liquid out mm -hmm. of the cheese, mm -hmm. either the cheesecloth, even though it's a mesh, it, I mean, filters it. But over time, when you keep doing it, you have little bits of cheese coming mm -hmm. out of the cloth mm -hmm. because the cloth expands 
and it just makes those small holes bigger. I gotcha, yep. And what happens with that is when there's a hole big enough for the cheese to go through, it makes con uh, contact from the chemicals inside the cloth and the chemicals outside the mm -hmm. cloth. And when that happens, the battery is shorted, it dies. And yep. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Once those two parts touch, they don't want to go anywhere else, <laughs> they want to go together. And, and that's, what, pretty that's what you want to avoid yeah. with these uh, high density batteries because once that's done, if it overheats, it's a firecracker. And there's a lot of these inside a battery pack. Well, but um, with going back to the quantum scape battery, they just got rid of the chemicals that they use in the anode, and now they're going into a pure lithium form where they get in their first uh, charge. And they start with no lithium on the anode, and then when they charge it, they deposit lithium on the anode. And with that, what, from what they're saying, they're going into a no dendrite uh, problem battery. With a, a ceramic divider or whatever in there? Yes, uh, they had that flexible ceramic plate that we were talking about. Uh, I remember one of the customer, one of the Q&A sessions, they asked uh, what that was made of, and they said, no, that's proprietary, you can't talk about it. <laughs> the magic sauce. The magic sauce. I but, did yeah. want to go over, I believe, the size ratio. Yes. Here we have, these are four uh, Model 3 cylinders. That's the deck of cards. And it's my understanding, if that was four times the energy density, there would be 16 of these inside there? Is that yes. the way so, you understand? So these four cells have about the same volume as this deck of cards. So if this deck of cards was the size of one of those cells, that's equivalent to 16 of these uh, cells. So, so that's, that, that's going to be a weight ratio. Now, and they also uh, fast charge, is that correct? Yes, so uh, with this uh, amount of density, usually you would worry about packing that much energy into a small area, how would the, the heating and cooling be a problem? Mm -hmm. But what they are saying without this dendrite problem, they can fast charge uh, at much faster rate. They said 15 minutes. For mm -hmm. a full charge, and um, that's a that would be a game changer. That's a big that, that's <laughs> a big deal. Yeah. But the question that I have there is, um, how big of a cable would you need to use? I yeah. Mean, yeah, yeah. Tesla yeah. right now uses in their version three uh, cooling lines around the cable so that they can keep the mm -hmm. charge cable warm. I mean, cool enough. Yep. Um, how would you get it in there? You probably yeah. You would charging have charging at three hundred and fifty kilowatts. So yeah, you would have a very big charging station. With big wires. Yes, so I that is that. okay. That is definitely something in the future we can look forward to. But the biggest change that I really was interested in the cooling, the the charging in the cold. They yeah, said, I had a little question about. Yeah. They said they can charge at negative can. thirty degrees Celsius, and that's really cold. So what that means is you can actually get away with most of the heating and cooling uh, lines that they have in the full pack battery. Okay. which means you can pack more cells in that area, and that means you don't have to worry much mm -hmm. about insulation either. And that's going to be really cool because uh, that increases the energy density in the full pack, and um, yep. more cars can get into it, and you can use it in different parts of the world without there rather worrying is, about heating or cooling. There is some thermal issues, absolutely. Oh, yes. I personally experience it. And <laughs> you, you don't charge well in the cold. You don't, uh, you have... Uh, a different battery cycle life, it, it shortens up. So those will be great. Uh, they're still dreams of the EV <laughs> world, I suppose. We'll classify them still in the dream state, but possibly gonna become reality. And I believe something will come out of it. Uh, and if it's in a car and you can drive from Los Angeles to New York, yeah. I shall be amazed and uh, uh, stunned and amazed and just uh, cheered them on. In so you know, we still love what they're doing, and I, I oh, yeah. uh, don't see it as uh, any immediate threat to Tesla and all the Tesloids. But uh, they definitely made a big breakthrough in battery yeah. technology with this. And one more thing I want to talk about was they put up this graph um, with the lithium mm -hmm. uh, stability when it went over the melting point of lithium. And what we've, we've seen videos of uh, Tesla mm -hmm. batteries when it gets too hot, it starts firecracking, it starts doing this exothermic reaction where it starts mm -hmm. boiling the metal, uh, the lithium off, and then it starts producing its own oxygen. 
And they did that test with their cell, and it shows the line just dips. Well, in this, they have the graph kind of flip, and it does an endothermic reaction. And that endothermic reaction is basically going from a solid state to liquid. It absorbs that energy, and that causes that dip. But then after that, it just keeps going like it doesn't care about the heat. And that, I think, That's is going to be a big deal for all these big car companies, because they want safety in yep. all their... Uh, cars. Oh, there's another one right there. And instead of investing in a big BMS like Tesla does, they just want a battery that would be as safe, safe as you can get it. Safe all so. the control, temperature, because you have to read temperature all the time. So Yes. Anyhow. So yeah, we'll see how uh, this is going to be, and I think Jack would have loved to see this himself. He would, and I have to have next section, where we've got something coming up for you viewers and long supporters of Jack. I have dug up through the archives <laughs> uh, one of his very special uh, old tech talks, and it's a lot of jacked, and it is very educational, and it's him really in his prime. It's from back in 2013, and uh, I think you're going to love it. Let's take yeah. a look at that. Okay. I uh, threatened to uh, talk about batteries today, uh, last week. I like to talk about batteries, actually. I like batteries better than I like electric cars. Originally we did an electric car while I was playing around with batteries. Um, the first thing we're going to do today is uh, take one apart and show it to you. So uh, cinch up your depends, old guys. We're going in. Let me see if I can find a knife. Ah, here next to my heart, heart, heart. This is a one, in, one each A123 cell. It is a lithium iron phosphate cell, which is uh, what I think everyone should use for uh, automotive purposes. This one is ostensibly um, ruined and at zero volts. I'm going to take this metal knife and cut into it, and we'll know pretty quick, huh? And I'm just going to scribe around here and see if I can uh, pull off the, uh, it's kind of a mic, uh, oh, what do you call it, not mica, um, the uh, mylar um, pouch. And inside, we have, this is a separator and some little green tapes holding it together. The uh, A123 cells are known for relatively high power. And uh, I'm going to show you why. I don't know if uh, you'll be able to tell from another cell. This is a... Uh, propylene separator, uh, just like a piece of very thin garbage bag. It is uh, electrically um, insulating, so it keeps the um, foils from touching each other and shorting, but it has, uh, it's microporous and absorbs electrolyte um, as do the anode and the cathode. And this is um, kind of in here in a zigzag between these foils. Here is a uh, foil, and it is copper, as you can see. And copper is our anode. And this dull material on here is a very fine graphite powder. Um, Graphite and, and uh, carbon are an excellent conductor, at least along one plane of their hexagonal uh, matrix, crystal matrix. And this is what our uh, lithium ions intercalate into um, when we charge the cell. And the purpose of the cell is to uh, store energy. And we do that by taking electrons from the 
anode or the cathode and storing them on this anode. Um, let's see what's our next sheet here. is shiny and so this is actually I'll scrape off a little bit so you can see this is actually aluminum and um, you can see on uh, both sides of this it's just shiny black now this side has a lot of uh, copper on it and um, that's a sign of an over-discharged cell, and we'll talk more about that later. But when we over-discharge the cell below a certain potential, the copper uh, that the anode's on uh, begins to come apart. And it migrates uh, throughout the battery and can form shunts um, and dendrites to um, short the cell, but it also uh, deposits uh, elsewhere here in this case you can see it deposited on the cathode well every place this copper is deposited now no longer can um, intercalate lithium ions the copper blocks that and we've got quite a bit on one side a little bit on the other maybe uh, some lithium plating on the other side this is kind of shiny um, most of our cells aren't but that is because um, lithium iron phosphate uh, does, actually doesn't conduct at all. Um, and so in order to um, get it to conduct and get a good current flow through the cell, they mix about 5% carbon in with the lithium iron phosphate. In the case of A123, they actually make a nanopowder um, granule of lithium iron phosphate and then coat that with uh, carbon and make a slurry and put it on this uh, aluminum foil on both sides in a uh, um, kind of like printing. Um, they put a slurry on it and then they mechanically press it between rollers. This is like in an argon uh, atmosphere and then they heat treat it and dry it out. Um, the binder is uh, kind of a polyvinyl dean um, material that is uh, sort of like conductive glue and uh, that's what binds it to that aluminum thing. So that's basically what we have is a aluminum um, uh, cathode with lithium iron phosphate on both sides and um, in this case, a little bit of copper, which is why we're at zero volts. And then our anode is copper with graphite, graphene, carbon black, hard carbon, or some mixture of all that. Again, in a very fine uh, powder that's mixed with the same polyvinylene a binder. And, um, and basically printed on each side of these very thin foils. Then the foils are gathered at the top and connected to these tabs and they uh, they kind of have tabs on them. Uh, these I've torn off but that alternate to where all your copper ones are connected to your negative terminal and all your aluminum are connected to the positive. This is your um, polyethylene separator and it's in a mylar pouch. And that makes up a, a lithium iron phosphate battery. For our larger prismatics, they're no different. Um, not quite as shiny, they use a little bigger particles, usually from a Lee's, uh, a company in Taiwan that have two sizes, uh, again, mixed with carbon, and the same kind of leaves are stuffed down into a plastic box. The, um, and then there's a heavier terminal that clamps um, really tabs just like this uh, from the foils uh, to the terminals that you screw into. And that is the physical construction and layout of a lithium iron, 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 iron phosphate um, cell. 
let's uh, make this go away. Let's review the basics first. Um, got my little diagram over here. You have a uh, cathode, which I just showed you. It's made of aluminum, and it has layers of um, lithium iron phosphate um, in it. And we'll talk a little more about that. The lithium is intercalated in that. And uh, when we charge, uh, we take an electron off this cathode, and that lowers its uh, um, potential to a more positive, um, it actually makes it more positive. And we take that around the top with our charger, and we go over and we pump that into our uh, anode. Um, a couple of things happen there. Let's talk about conduction and conductivity because there's um, actually a pretty broad um, oversimplification of this that's okay, but let's go a little deeper. If we take uh, a non-conductive item like uh, plastic or um, mylar or um, um, ultra high molecular weight uh, uh, Teflon or something like that. Those are very long chain polymers and they have a number of elements uh, bound up together and almost no uh, free electrons and so they cannot conduct electricity. Um, metals on the other hand can and the reason for that is that metals will have a number of electrons in the outer valence band somewhat loosely tied to the um, um, atom, as we may have said, um, that it, it, depending on the level of the valence band will be a different number of electrons that are said to be full. If you have more than half of those electrons, uh, they tend to bind pretty tightly to the atom and they, they will readily accept electrons from other atoms. If you have less than half, um, then there we refer to them as uh, um, minus electrons, um, where they will give them up quite easily. Um, and all metals uh, tend to have uh, less than half uh, the full um, outer valence band and will give up electrons. Lithium is an extreme case of this. It has uh, one um, electron that it, it gives up um, we call it the party girl of uh, batteries. It gives it up very easily. Um, when you take a, a metal, a pure metal, or even a metal alloy, what you do is take uh, the element, uh, copper or uh, uh, iron or uh, lithium or whatever the metal is, and it forms a, um, uh, a matrix, a, um, a crystalline structure by sharing electrons. In so doing, there's a number of them left over. Extra electrons, or we normally term that free electrons. Uh, they exist in the metal, but they're not connected to any of the atoms. They're simply uh, a cloud uh, of free electrons uh, in that device. Um, I'd like you to think of that as a gas under pressure. Electrons, as we know, uh, all have a negative charge, and they repel each other. And so think of it as a gas in a container. Your wire is actually a container, and it's full of electrons, free electrons, and they're a gas, and they push out against all edges of that wire uh, to the skin um, because they're trying to get away from each other. They repel each other. And, and the number of electrons in there is a function of that pressure. And so if we introduce an electron by force with a power supply in one end of that uh, wire, uh, we increase that pressure by one electron. And um, that's instantly felt through the whole wire. And so we say that electricity travels at the speed of light. Um, Okay, 
I'm not too sure, it's pretty much instantaneous, that pressure is exhibited through the whole length of the wire um, so quickly that we think it's close to uh, um, 300 million meters a, a second. And so um, that happens instantaneously. If you put it in at one end of a thousand foot wire, you increase the pressure through the whole wire and uh, that's felt at the far end instantly. Uh, if we put a power supply on the two ends and we put electrons in one end and take them out the other, we do have electron flow. The, um, uh, and we have current flow out in one end and out the other, uh, but along the way, all these electrons um, seek to repel each other. The actual electron flow, the movement of an electron through the wire, uh, would you believe, and this varies depending on the temperature, um, the size of the conductor, uh, and so forth, uh, two or two and a half inches a minute, not very fast. In actually moving through the wire, it collides with other things, impurities. The um, crystalline structure is often uh, imperfect, and almost always is imperfect, lots of fractures and so forth. It'll bump into an atom, dislodge one of the electrons that are there and take its place. Well, but that frees up an electron. That is uh, kind of the function of resistance, and that's what causes heat under current flow, and higher current flow, higher heat, is the actual physical motion of the electrons through the conductor. But the effects are a, a charge effect that's universally felt throughout the conductor instantaneously. If I put one electron in one end, I've increased the pressure at every point, including the other end, uh, by exactly one electron. And so when we hook up our charger here, and I say we pull an electron off here, they usually depict this as an electron traveling over here. Instantly, the charge on the whole anode, or the whole cathode, and the carbon that is mixed into the um, um, cathode material is instantly decreased. It becomes more positive. And instantly, the um, anode, current collector, and the carbon that's connected to that uh, becomes a one electron more negative. Now, the actual route of the electron through the wire uh, could take uh, seconds, minutes, days, I don't know how long is it and how big a round is it and so forth. But the charge is felt immediately. And that's not very important, but I'd like you to keep it in mind. So we're going to take electrons off of this end. Instantly, our um, cathode current collector and our cathode material um, becomes more positive. And in becoming more positive, um, it to some degree repels a positive ion. And we have two to pick from, lithium and uh, iron. And lithium, as I said, is the party girl. So it exits this material. Um, this diagram actually shows a little SEI layer on the cathode. That's true, but it's such a little bit of material and, and so inconsequential to battery operation, um, you, you can ignore it. Um, that um, lithium ion is going to come out into our electrolyte. Now the electrolyte is the same thing. It's um, made up of a lithium hexafluorophosphate, um, which is a lithium salt, um, short form is LiPF6, and that is positive lithium ions throughout the electrolyte. And of course, much like the negative charges of the electrons, they uh, seek to repel each other. And so they have a pressure in the electrolyte. So when we say that lithium ions travel from the cathode to the anode, that's true, they do. But what really happens is it comes off the cathode here 
increases the pressure everywhere, and our differential here at the anode uh, goes up. The carbon in, on the anode is more negative, and the positive pressure from the electrolyte, and the electrolytes necessary to conduct this, uh, goes up more positive. And so that's what causes intercalation at the anode side. Um, let's drop that for a minute. And, um, and, and so when, when, well, when the lithium ion intercalates in this crystalline matrix on the cathode side, on the anode side, um, that uh, pairs with the negative charge of the electron that we put there and kind of neutralizes it to the point that we can store more electrons on that current collector because we keep absorbing that charge with our positive lithium ions, or counteracting it to some degree. The lithium ion is actually not molecularly part of the carbon. It's held between graphene sheets. Each carbon sheet is made up of a hexagonal or six uh, atom ring, and uh, then the sheet beneath it is likewise. The lithium ion is actually held between the sheets, exactly halfway between the sheets, and exactly centered in that six um, atom ring. Um, picture the uh, metal ball levitation thing on YouTube where you've got two magnets and then this ball and they can hold it in position with the magnetic field. This is an electrostatic field, but same concept, and it's held in that position um, between the um, layers of uh, carbon uh, crystal sheet. Let's uh, talk a little bit more about something we haven't covered very well because it's a little bit complex, and that is our uh, cathode material. Um, I'm going to put this up there. This shows here a grain, a single grain of uh, lithium iron phosphate. Uh, lithium, we know, is an element. Iron is uh, pretty uh, common. Uh, phosphate is a combination of phosphorus and oxygen. And in fact, iron phosphate is a very common dirt cheap fertilizer. And so with a very small amount of lithium and some fertilizer, we can make a battery. It's also totally non-toxic in any respect. These are so much more benign than a lead acid battery. Lead is actually a horrible poison. Iron phosphate is a, a garden supplement. Uh, it's dirt cheap and it's um, um, entirely benign. It, uh, we mix lithium in with it. It forms um, what's called a uh, polyanion, um, and more commonly, a uh, olivine crystal structure. And um, that's a little bit complicated. We have the phosph phosphorus, or the phosphate, um, would be the larger blue sections here. The um, orange sections would be our iron that's bound to that. And between that is some channels, uh, a zigzag path, really, of, um, uh, of space left over in this matrix. And the um, lithium ion, uh, if that structure is uh, um, sufficiently negative, um, will be held in place with that same electrostatic charge. But there is a difference on this end. These channels are very narrow. And so we think of that as, uh, they call it a domino effect. Uh, if you add an electron in here at the bottom, anywhere in here, uh, it has to move up. Uh, all the electrons in front of it, or lithium ions in front of it, have to move ahead one position. And they are positions, kind of like dimples in the Chinese checkers uh, um, board, um, BBs in the little toy that you have to put all the BBs in the right place. Um, 
are, they lock into these positions, and then you, if you shove another one in behind, it'll move, move the ones ahead up. And so they actually have to tunnel um, in there, and that diffusion is uh, what limits um, the power uh, output of uh, lithium iron phosphate and, um, um, and causes the diffusion delay, as well as on the anode side. You can see over here on the, the grain, a very small nanoparticle of uh, lithium iron phosphate, um, that it, it works its way in from the out to the in. Um, and that's what they're trying to depict here is, you know, the core and then, then the outer area as it fills in with this intercalation. Um, I've got another diagram that shows this a little better, a little larger, but again, you can see the, uh, um, the uh, um, phosphate um, and the iron, and the red balls are lithium ions that have winded their way through this tunnel structure um, to intercalate there. Um, Let me put up another diagram. This is from the um, thesis of um, Mr. Jens Groot, um, Division of Electric Power Engineering, Department of Energy and Environment at Chalmers University of Technology in Gothenburg, Sweden. And he did a 150-page analysis of um, cycle testing in lithium, we're going to talk some more about because I, I like it, it's a little scattered. This diagram shows you some of the breakdowns that are common um, in lithium iron, uh, ion cells. Um, you have your current collector corrosion, micro cracking of the graphene layers, and here is your SEI layer. And um, um, they're talking about SEI dissolution, SEI reformation and growth, um, and so forth. Let's uh, talk about the solid electrolyte interphase layer because it's kind of important to um, Boeing um, Dreamliners. When you first make a cell, there are no lithium ions in the uh, cathode. There's lithium uh, mixed in. And what we do in our first charge, it causes the electrons to be ripped away from the lithium, and we then have a lithium ion. And that migrates through the electrolyte, and the electrolyte has lithium uh, ions in it, as I said, and the pressure builds, and it intercalates into the uh, anode side. But along the way, there are some interactions. Occasionally, a lithium ion, for whatever reason, will collide with some of the um, materials in the organic solvents that are used um, to uh, suspend the lithium salt, the LIPF6, or lithium hexafluorophosphate, in the electrolyte. The solvents commonly used are an ethylene uh, carbonate, EC, uh, dimethylene carbonate, DMC, diethylene carbonate, DEC, and uh, occasionally some polyvinyl carbonate, PC, um, that's used as a stabilizer. Um, and that's the liquid that make up the uh, uh, electrolyte. Now, why do we do that with organic solvents? Water undergoes hydrolysis at a little over two volts. And so an aqueous solution, since our cell, the difference in potential uh, in the cell is uh, the lithium uh, on, on the cathode is about three and a half volts. The uh, potential of the uh, anode is typically uh, 100 to 150 millivolts the other direction. And when we algebraically sum that positive and negative, that's where we get our 3.4 volts uh, open circuit voltage on a lithium 
iron phosphate cell, which is quite different from the other um, lithium chemistries. There'll be different um, redox potentials for the anode and cathode and exhibit a different open circuit voltage. As we go across here uh, to the anode, we might collide with uh, certain impurities, the most horrendous one being water. Um, but these organic solvents do not hydrolyze at the 3.6 volts. Water would, and that would essentially uh, destroy our uh, electrolyte and give off hydrogen and oxygen and, and blow up our battery. So at these higher voltages of 3.6 volts, we have to use non-aqueous, non-water bearing, organic solvents and EC, DEC, DMC, and PC are the normal ones. Everybody's got a different magic sauce of those electrolytes, thinking it'll make their battery better, and some do. Unfortunately, the lithium ion, if it comes in contact with certain elements of these larger organic molecules, uh, can have a reaction. Uh, the first thing I want you to remember is that reaction always re results in heat. Now, if it's an occasional bump in the night, it's a little bit of heat. And it causes it to rain a precipitate that is kind of a polyvinyl. And that migrates to the surface of the anode and coats the grains of the uh, carbon. And that um, in the formative stage of the battery, and certainly the first couple of charges, they tend to charge it very slowly at low current levels. And this SEI layer, or solid electrolyte interphase layer, builds up kind of a rubbery skin on the surface of our carbon anode. That's kind of important in this case. And here's why. Um, we can store a lot of lithium ions in this carbon. And, and to give you an, a, an order of magnitude there, the uh, iron phosphate can typically store about 170 uh, um, milliamp hours of um, um, cations um, per gram. The carbon is actually much more capable at about 372 milliamp hours per gram. So it's over twice um, the thing. Now they'll adjust that by having more uh, of the lithium iron phosphate and a thinner layer of the carbon. But it's still normally you'll have more storage here than you have over here. Um, as, this as, as this thing charges the first couple of times, this SEI layer forms. Well, it's got some unique properties. Uh, it kind of glues all the carbon together, which the carbon does get about a 10% volumetric expansion and contraction uh, during intercalation and deintercalation. Uh, but more importantly, the organic molecules in the electrolyte cannot pass through the SEI layer at all. They just can't do it. But the lithium ions can. Now they have to kind of tunnel through there, and so the SEI layer becomes kind of a function of our DC impedance or resistance of the battery itself. Because lithium ions have to migrate through that SEI layer. Um, interestingly, in an over-discharge situation, um, or in a, a trying to charge in very, very cold weather, uh, uh, really for lithium iron phosphate, anything below freezing, uh, the lithium can't um, migrate through the SEI layer then, and it forms a lithium plating on top of the SEI layer, which is not good. But normally, whenever we're charging the cell, lithium ions migrate through the SEI layer and are stored between the graphene sheets uh, on the uh, anode. And these graphene sheets, as this picture depicts, 
are not how you normally see them with, uh, you know, just teeth sticking out at regular intervals from the current collector. They're actually a jumble of sheets. And so it's not homogenous. Some places accept lithium ions uh, more readily than others uh, because the graphene sheets are turned in a certain way or at a certain polarity uh, that's more receptive to the lithium ions. So the more homogenous we can get this, the smoother our SEI layer will be. But, but this is at a molecular level. So once the lithium ion is in there, it's safe because the electrolyte, the solvents, cannot pass through the SEI layer. This lithium ion over here in the carbon cannot come in contact with the solvent and cannot have that reaction. And that's a good thing because over time we're going to bring lithium ions through here and store them over here and they're going to build up. And so that's, uh, that's an important concept is that that SEI layer insulates the lithium ions from reacting with the uh, solvents. And the solvents, it takes a certain contact um, with the lithium ions to have these reactions. So many lithium ions come through and don't have that reaction at all and get through the SEI layer and are safe in the, the carbon um, anode. Ah, now, let's charge the battery completely. And we have taken all of the lithium out of the uh, cathode and we have uh, migrated it through the electrolyte and we have stored it in the uh, anode. But we still have a charger hooked up here. Um, that's going to do a couple of things. The remaining lithium ions in our electrolyte that are always there uh, begin to migrate out into the anode, but that drops the positive level of the electrolyte. And um, that, if you drop to the positive level, you're becoming more negative. You have to have a difference of potential here of, you know, at least 50 millivolts, better 100. Um, to get across here. And so what happens is that potential drops and we start to uh, have lithium ions collect on the surface of the SEI and it can't get through. And uh, as another lithium ion comes along, uh, they combine into a crystalline structure. And we build up lithium plating on the uh, uh, SEI layer. Some of it does get through the SEI layer from that crystalline structure. And so we have kind of a wound in our SEI layer that is a function of the size of that lithium crystal, and it tends to grow outwards as a dendrite. Um, some describe it as moss. Um, more commonly, you'll hear it termed a dendrite a little needle that comes out and starts poking into our separator. If it goes through the separator, we short the cell and we have a fire. But we don't have to do that to get a fire. Well, over here, we're still taking electron, we're still charging. Where can we get a uh, cation from this uh, now delithiated iron phosphate? Well, from the iron. It's a uh, cation too, an ion, a positive ion. And so we start to leach iron that is released from our cathode side into the electrolyte. This has a couple of effects. One, uh, we're seriously degrading the structural integrity of our uh, matrix at that point. Remember, the lithium ion just kind of tunneled in, but the iron was kind of bound to the phosphate as we uh, um, start to pull more negative charge off of this, making a more positive charge, the iron um, uh, positive cation comes out. And it starts to migrate through the electrolyte. And it deposits on the SEI layer. And it will form dendrites. And it'll even form compounds with the lithium. And so now we have wounds and ulcer here. When we do that, we're opening a hole, a crack, a fissure 
in the SEI layer. And that lets these organic solvents get to some of the nearby lithium ions that are held in the carbon. And that gives off heat. And that kind of worsens the problem, softening the SEI layer around this ulcer of dendrites of iron or lithium and uh, lets in more organic solvents. Um, and obviously if you have a point and it's growing, the circumference of the ring um, grows too. And so there's a greater area and exposing new areas of carbon with lithium tightly intercalated in there to the organic solvents and they react with the organic solvents. They're held in position now. They're going to come in contact. And that gives off heat. At a, between 110 and 130 degrees centigrade, the SEI layer starts to come unglued. It starts to melt. It's coming apart. And as it comes apart, now those solvents, here is this huge treasure trove of lithium ions suddenly exposed, um, fairly suddenly exposed to uh, these solvents and reacting with it and generating heat. And we go into thermal runaway. Now before that even happens, at about 90 degrees centigrade, one of our organic solvents, um, uh, dimethyl carbonate, I believe, DMC, has a boiling point of 90 degrees centigrade. And that starts to give off gas, which um, causes our cell to swell up. And um, there is no scenario where a cell simply um, swells on its own. There's no magic here. Swelling is telling. It's damage. And it's caused by the um, gasification usually of DMC. And, the, and DMC also gives it kind of that sweet pear smell when it vents. And you can smell a battery going bad. It's kind of a sweet pear smell. Um, but in any event, this is going into thermal runaway. And um, as it gets hotter, the remaining SEI dissolves. And now all of our lithium ions can react with our solvents. And the temperature just keeps going up. Over here on the cathode, we have some iron remaining, some phosphorus, and some oxygen. And at about 250 degrees centigrade, um, up to about 400, this starts to break down and release free oxygen. Now, free oxygen can combine with the electrolytes and with the lithium ions, and we have a fire burning out of control that you can't put out because it makes its own oxygen. Why do I like lithium iron phosphate so well? Well, because it's at 250 degrees centigrade and up to about 400 degrees centigrade, and it's not really a lot of oxygen that it releases. In the case of lithium cobalt oxide, it's a lot of oxygen, and it starts to go at 130 degrees centigrade, which is back here where we're melting our SEI layer, at between 130 and 150 degrees centigrade. So a much lower temperature will cause free oxygen in a lithium cobalt oxide cell, and that's why they burn. They don't burn because they're lithium cobalt oxide. There is no magic. They do not spontaneously go into ignition. If they burn, it's because somebody overcharged them. Now, the, the voltage on lithium cobalt oxide is 3.72. There is somehow gotten to be a belief system, usually among the same guys that are trying to top balance these batteries, <coughs> that they can float that cell at 4 volts and they will not overcharge it. I have no idea where this comes from. It's prevalent, it runs through the whole thing, and I think it goes back to lead acid. The open circuit voltage of these cells is a function of the lithium compound, uh, the redox electropotential of the lithium compound in the cathode, algebraically summed 
with the same thing in the carbon anode. And whatever that comes out to, you, me, and Jesus Christ can't change. It just is what it is. If you apply any potential to these metal current collectors above that, you are charging the cell. That you're not charging it very hard, nobody, including most of all the cell, cares. You're still charging the cell. You're still migrating lithium and, and perhaps iron from the cathode to the anode. That you're doing it slowly or fastly is not the point. The damage is really pretty much the same. It may be slower coming up to it until this goes into cascade and you're, you actually melt the SEI layer and dump. You could kind of sneak up on it for a while and do a lot of damage without actually getting into thermal because it's more gradual. But it's eventually going to go. And when it does, you go into thermal runaway. It's better to have a lithium iron phosphate cell than it is a lithium cobalt simply by temperature. But either one of them, neither one of them, will spontaneously and as if by magic burst into flame, uh, no matter how roughly you handle them. Um, external temperatures can bring these up to where all this happens anyway. Uh, above 110 degrees centigrade, the SEI layer is going to start to melt if the battery is not even working. Above 150 in um, uh, lithium cobalt, it's going to start giving off free oxygen. Now everybody worries about the electrolytes. It's true they are flammable. And it's true if they vent, they will gasify um, into a very fine vapor that theoretically could be explosive. But what these are, are um, methanols and ethanols. Uh, it's like whiskey. You can pour 100 proof whiskey in your hand and light it with a match and it won't burn your hand while it's burning. Its escape velocity is faster than the flame. I've done it. it, it doesn't, your hand doesn't even get warm uh, as long as it's going up. So while they're, the solvents are flammable, that's no part of this really. Um, it's not a problem. It doesn't cause anything. Uh, it's a side effect. Uh, the dimethyl uh, carbonate uh, DMC uh, has the lowest boiling point at about 90 degrees centigrade and it turns to a gas and swells up the battery and vents the battery and that's really kind of disconnected. It's an early sign there's a problem but um, it's, um, it's not what causes the fire. And so the, the real problem is the uh, gradual and then accelerating breakdown of the solid electrolyte interphase layer um, which um, uh, in reacting with the lithium um, ions, it gives off an increasing level of heat and goes into a thermal runaway situation. If that catches up the um, uh, cathode, um, it's kind of all bets are off. You will not get it stopped burning until it runs out of oxygen and uh, halon and so forth on top of it doesn't have any effect because it's getting the oxygen from the material itself. Um, I mentioned, so I hope that, that shows you what happens when you overcharge the cell. Um, uh, very quickly, and uh, uh, because it's not terribly interesting, but you saw in my deconstruct of the over-discharge cell that below a certain potential, um, the copper on the current collector uh, starts to uh, lose physical integrity and it leaches through the uh, SEI and into the cell and it can be deposited anywhere. And it does form dendrites and it does short um, your remaining cells which have no charge on them anyway, but this is why you can't put a charge on them when you get done. You're, you're shorted out by dissolved copper. So that's your two failure modes is over discharge and overcharge. And overcharge being the more likely to cause a fire over discharge can, and that is the other um, uh, mode of overcharge, if a dendrite pierces the insulator and shorts to the next cell, you will get current flow and it will cause heat. Well now, we've got the same problem. That heat is going to break down the SEI layer. 
and melt it. Now again, at between 110 and 130 degrees centigrade, this comes apart. It doesn't care where the 110 or 130 come from, it's still going to come apart and go into thermal runaway. So dendrite formation to the point where it pierces the uh, separator and actually shorts um, an anode to a cathode, uh, you'll get instant current flow there. And uh, in the case of over discharge, you really don't, but the next time you charge it, you will. And so if you have a, a battery that's gone flat, hook it up to the charger and run a few amps into it. What you'll normally see is it comes up to about a volt, volt and a half, and then it reverses and starts to go down. You're done. If it doesn't continue on up, you will not recover that cell. It'll normally come up, I've seen them to a volt, a volt and a half, and they're coming up pretty good, and then they reverse and start going down. Um, you're headed for a short circuit, and it will cause a fire if you continue to charge. Just disconnect the charger and walk away, you're done. You cannot get that one back. Um, let's take a short break. I mentioned that I got some of these diagrams from um, a guy in Sweden who's doing his uh, uh, thesis for his um, licentiate uh, from an engineering school. Uh, he's combined a lot of too much uh, into one 150-page document, but buried in there is some very interesting information about cycle life, cycle life testing, and the effects of various things on the longevity of your cells. Stay with me. We're back at the big green wall, and we're going to talk now a little bit about what causes a deterioration in your battery cells. I have a relatively new document, 2012, which is a thesis for the degree of licentiate of engineering um, titled State of Health Estimation of Lithium-Ion Batteries Cycle Life Test Methods by Jens Groot. He's at the Division of Electric Power Engineering, Department of Energy and Environment, Chalmers University of Technology of Gothenburg, Sweden. Um, and he did this in 2012. Um, like many young people, he bit off a bit more than he could chew. He's combined a whole lot of things um, into one massive test Impressive, not only in its length, but its breadth, um, most of which serves to confuse a few basic issues. But he did uh, get some very interesting things in there and did, in his conclusions, uh, dig them out uh, fairly properly, I think. This is our document. What we're showing here, and this is not a good graphic, it's not going to be easy for you to read, but I'll point some things out to you. Um, our axis, vertical axis here, is percent of the original capacity of the cell, with 100% at the top and 0% at the bottom. Um, he calls it capacity throughput across the x-axis. This is actually the number of cycles out to 12,000. Uh, he actually performed 9,000 cycles on a whole series of cells under different conditions. And uh, I, uh, we have to talk about that a little bit. The uh, purple and the kind of dirty green um, graphs here are um, both uh, cycle A. Cycle A is uh, a very uh, convoluted thing of, um, uh, it's basically a simulation of a city bus route by a hybrid bus in Gothenburg, Sweden. Now I know you all thought that Batman was a US figure. He's actually apparently Swedish. And as we all know, Gothenburg is his, uh, or was that Gotham City? In any event, Gothenburg has a hybrid bus. They took 40,000 measurements uh, during a typical day a route through this city and reduced it to 2,000 seconds at different levels. 
and, and so ran this as a cyclic test. Um, they did 9,000 of these cycles, and if you notice, there's uh, kind of a, uh, a line. That's the filtered output. The individual marks are where they did a, uh, uh, a repetitive performance test on the battery that was completely different. That measured uh, um, the capacity, uh, the power output, the um, uh, uh, internal resistance, and so forth of the cell. Uh, and so they plotted it uh, by the number of cycles, of course. Um, interesting to note of cycle A, and I've got it over here on this uh, uh, table, but cycle A uh, only varied from 50% uh, state of charge uh, down to 22.6% uh, state of charge, but included accelerations of this bus and regenerative braking. And the, the peak charge current was 17.3C, uh, and the uh, peak discharge current was 22.3C, which is a lot of current and a lot of strain on a cell. Um, you will see also a cycle C, and it's over here in a blue and a kind of a teal um, that you can barely tell apart. It just looks like a dark blue line. Um, and um, that is cycle C, which is from about 11.4% state of charge to 100% state of charge, and at a constant current of charge and discharge of 3.76 C. Now this is how you normally see a cycle testing then is 100% down to some low value or even 0% um, at a fixed rate. This is kind of a high rate at 3.76C. You'll often see this done at 1C. Um, but as you can see, uh, the two C cycles uh, both reach 80% of capacity, right about 2,000 cycles. And these are indeed LIFO4 cells. They're not the ones we use. They're not A123 and they're not um, um, uh, CALBs, but very similar uh, cells in all respect. And so when we say you get 2,000 cycles, this is the testing that does this. Now here's one of the reasons I'm kind of keen on these batteries. Um, Cycle A is more like you're driving a car. Actually, it's more like you're driving a bus, and it's more like you're driving a bus in Gotham City, Sweden, but uh, it's a real life thing where you accelerate and decelerate and do this, um, uh, it's actually 2,000 um, little iterations uh, over 2,000 seconds, um, draining us uh, from 50% state of charge uh, down to about 22.6%. Uh, Notice that we're not going to um, fully discharge, and we're not going to fully charge. This starts, each cycle starts at 50% state of charge. <coughs> he only fully charges it on the dots here. Um, circles and triangles, the green and the purple, um, where he stops and measures capacity of the cell. Um, at 9,000 cycles, we're still about 85% uh, on the green one, and we cross 80% uh, right at about 9,000 cycles um, on the, the purple one. <clears throat> Let's talk about that for a minute. The purple one um, is at 23 degrees centigrade. The green one is in a climate box at 35 degrees centigrade. He wanted to see what the effects of temperature was on um, life uh, of the batteries and uh, stated early in his assumptions that, of course, it would uh, uh, cause earlier failure. Um, Arrhenius law, our equation, and um, unfortunately, his data uh, supported in my view that for some reason these cells, everything in them works better at higher temperatures 
up to a point. And I think that point is about 45 degrees centigrade. Doing this at 35 degrees centigrade, what's that, a little over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, um, the cell lasted noticeably, demonstrably and measurably longer than it did um, at 23 degrees uh, centigrade. And normally you'll see our specs um, of uh, cycle life and uh, our curves uh, at 25C, um, but for some reason he used 23. If you look at cycle C, of course, with the 2,000 cycles, that's actually, uh, both of them, there's no difference, and so they draw as one kind of blue line. There's actually two map there, and um, one of them is pluses and one of them is squares, and it goes uh, on this extended cycle map out to 12,000 cycles, it looks very sharp. But this is our normal cycle life um, depiction um, of um, 80 percent um, to 2,000 cycles. But that's charged to 100 percent and discharged to 11 percent in each cycle and there really isn't any difference between 23 and uh, 35 degrees centigrade which could lead some to believe, because lead acid cells fail earlier at higher temperatures, that uh, that would be true of lithium cells. I've known for some time that it isn't. I've actually read some papers recently where they proved that they were. They were really bad papers, um, and so I haven't uh, cited them. This young man, student's uh, work, uh, I find much more persuasive um, because of the number of cycles uh, the very careful climate control of the uh, 35 degree um, uh, test and uh, at every step on cycle A, the real driving cycle, um, that you can see a clear differentiation between the green and the purple with the purple failing first and the green never really quite reaching 80% during the test. It never did get down to 80% capacity on any of his interim, uh, what does he call them, RPTs, uh, reference uh, um, mm, uh, power tests. Or, uh, and so uh, there's a couple of things that jump out of this at me um, and, and kind of tend to refute a lot of what is being talked about about, about these cells. First, elevated temperature, at least at a 35 degree centigrade rate, does not decrease cell life, it appears to increase it. Second note that this uh, um, Gotham City driving cycle uh, is at 17 and 22 um, uh, C, very high charge and discharge current rates, and um, clearly it's not a problem. And by doing the actual driving, when we say that, that um, the other thing that jumps right out at me is here is our curve of 2,000 cycles to 100% charge to 11% state of charge and simply repeated at a continuous rate uh, over and over again by a very stupid um, MAKO um, test um, um, computer. That's what we're used to seeing. And that's what we're used to seeing about LiPo4 cells at 2,000 cycles, sometimes 3,000 cycles. They say that if you limit it to 20% depth of discharge, you can go 3,000 cycles. No one sits around and, and runs their batteries this way. You're going to drive a car like cycle A. And the good news is that um, in this test, you get nine or 10,000 cycles and you're still not at 80%. And that is what's going on with LiPo4 cells. Now I will say that there is an extreme element in here and that his maximum state of charge is 50%. And so it would appear that the dangers to um, cycle life are not temperature and they're not the amount of current that you draw out of them. Um, it is a function of the extreme ends 
of the charge and discharge cycle. I've said this for years. If you could charge it to 51% state of charge, discharge it to 49%, and then charge it again to 51% and stay in that range, they would last forever. Um, according to Mr. Groot's uh, study, I would say probably three and a half forever. Um, and um, uh, um, again, the trick is not to over discharge and not to overcharge. Uh, we bottom balance the cells to prevent damage in over discharge, and we uh, undercharge the cells slightly. I would say if cycle life is your main criteria, and it's certainly up there for me, I don't need the range, I need the batteries to last a long time, um, that it would be perfectly permissible to drop your charge voltage, uh, not even to jack 3.55, but let's say 3.4, the open circuit voltage of the cells and charge them to 60% or 70% and then stop them in all cases before they get below 20%, these cells could literally do 10,000 cycles. If you do 300 cycles a year, that's 30 years that the batteries will last. Uh, and I believe it's entirely possible. Um, the functions of aging he cites primarily as a depletion of the recyclable lithium. As you uh, use these cells, more uh, very gradually, the SEI phase uh, formed very quickly at the beginning and then much more slowly, but it does continue to form for the entire life of the cell. It thickens and it takes more lithium out of the game. You also have fractures in the carbon um, and fractures in the uh, cathode material uh, that mm, eliminate cyclable lithium. And so he, he blames most of the aging on uh, depletion of the available lithium ions. That opens up a curious situation. I could pull that vent cap and with a needle, stick it down in there and poke a bunch of uh, lithium hexafluorophosphate in, LIPF6, and replenish the amount of uh, available cyclable lithium. Now, I can't restore the areas that are blocked off by lithium plating or iron plating or so forth, but if you'll avoid fully charging them and avoid fully dis discharging them, you shouldn't have any of that. And so we can see a huge extension of life cycle way beyond what we had assumed. And this was alluded to by uh, Professor Jay Whitaker at Carnegie Mellon after some tests of A123 cells that 7,000, 10,000, 15,000 cycles are not out of the question during, in, in a certain op restricted operating zone. And this then appears to be it. So. We can take a lot of current out of the cells. I had suspected that too high a current level might uh, damage the cells. And of course, I've been kind of a, the lonely voice on uh, that temperature, uh, high temperatures, um, were not as damaging to cycle life as we had thought. In this, it's absolutely definitive and with a huge number of cycles and a clear uh, delineation of temperature from 23 to 35 degrees and a big separation in the results um, that a higher temperature up to a point actually extends the life of the cells, increases its performance, uh, increases its capacity, and it isn't always a good thing for lithium ion um, iron phosphate cells. Um, and so the heavy current loads and temperature do not appear to be players in shortening the life, but fully charging the cell and fully discharging the cell does. Here's 2,000 cycles, here's 9,000 cycles. The 9,000 come as the result of charge and discharges, a map, a program derived, they took 40,000 data points from an actual bus drive and filtered them down to 2,000 seconds with a different value each second and ran that as a program. And that was the uh, 
um, uh, the cycle they performed there and had um, five times longer cell life uh, with that as long as they started at 50% state of charge and didn't go below 22%, um, that it was fine. And so the biggest uh, determinant of cycle life uh, I would draw from this young man's work is um, the state of charge, how close, how far you push the limits, the top and the bottom. There's no reason to be there. Um, fully charging the cell, what if you gave up a mile, two miles, five miles, and just drove it less, it's a $10,000 pack of batteries, and it lasts 20 years now instead of five years. Is that worth it? Well, I don't know, the batteries are gonna change, maybe not. Um, the amount of current you take out of them doesn't appear to be a problem, and that the heating uh, does not appear to be a problem. Um, you certainly want to keep it um, below uh, the, the area of 60 to 90 degrees centigrade, but we don't have a problem with that anyway. Our cells will generate 10 degrees centigrade under extreme abuse current-wise. Uh, under 3C uh, charges, um, and so uh, the, the high temperature, the, the necessity for cooling them, um, I, I simply do not see it. We do not cool cells. In fact, we're leaning more toward heating cells all the time. Certainly if you live in a cold weather climate, uh, lithium plating is very real when charging below zero uh, degree centigrade, and it's quite extremely real uh, at 20 degrees centigrade below. So if you're going to do anything, uh, heat your batteries, don't cool them. And uh, I'm going to be a little less worried about how much current we take out of these cells. Uh, 10C from these uh, calves, I don't think it's a problem. Um, we'll use 60 amp, and what that means, I can use 60 amp hour cells, take 600 amps out of them, and it's probably not going to do anything uh, to my cell life as what I'm getting from this paper. Um, and finally, and to reiterate, very carefully, a very fully charging your pack is a loser. Let it get up to 3.45, 3.55 volts per cell. Uh, if you have 10 cells, that's, uh, you know, 35 volts. <laughs> Cut it off. Take the penalty. Um, it's not worth damaging the cells to get another mile of range or even two miles. And what some of these top balancing guys were doing was getting 300 yards, uh, endangering the cells continuously for absolutely nothing. Um, not enough range to fool with. Um, and so that's my advice on uh, life uh, cycle extension. Um, and this paper has been pretty definitive in what that is. Not heat, not current abuse, state of charge. Avoid the two ends and your batteries will last a long time. And the good news is, in a real driving cycle, your cycle A, you're automatically going to get a lot more cycles than what's on the spec sheet, uh, cycle C, at 2,000 or 3,000. So all around good news, I think. And uh, so I thought I'd throw that in with our discussion of how to burn up a battery. It's also how to make one last forever. And that appears to be the, the state. Uh, I would say um, the ideal is 80% uh, uh, state of charge to 20% state of charge. Coincidentally, that's about what the General Motors is doing with the Chevy Volt. Who would have thunk it? Stay with us.